I kind of just like to live between the layers of abstraction. So um, this is actually like where chaos usually occurs is between the layers of abstraction because um, you kind of have one thing talking to another thing. Um, and I also enjoy kind of pulling features from one layer out into the other. So who here has actually like run Docker in production? I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, whenever you, know, you are doing these things from one layer into the other, that is where chaos forms. So this is kind of like what the world looks like, I guess, in my mind. Um, so you have the kernel and then containers on top, which are using the system calls exposed by the kernel. And then uh, containers kind of expose, you know, APIs and config files or whatever. Um, and then Kubernetes and orchestrators and the API on top. Obviously, this is, it gets way more granular than that, but, you know, layers of software on top of each other until the end of time. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I kind of thought that I'd start with some fun bugs because it seemed like a lot of people were talking about like weird shit that had happened and I I've seen like some really weird shit. Um, <laughs> and I love talking about bugs. Bugs are like my favorite thing. Uh, some people like really hate when they get one of those bugs that turns out to be like a rabbit hole and then you're kind of debugging it until the end of time. And like while debugging those bugs, I hate them. But after I'm like, that was crazy. Um, so, yeah, it's like a hate love relationship there, to be honest. Um, so one of my favorites, actually, of a bug that we found was just, like, super bizarre. So um, when I was working on Docker with everyone, uh, we would obviously compile Docker um, and it's written in Go. And we use compile time variables, which, like, in Go, you pass with a dash x um, it, as L, LD flags and stuff. Um, so this is the way that Docker had been compiled, like, even before I had started there. Like, this is how we compiled Docker. So, um, like, way down into kind of along the path of that I had worked there, all of a sudden um, our binaries kind of started changing. Um, and at first we thought it was due to the Go version, but the actual behavior we saw was that our compile time variable that we set just to like verify that we were a static binary, we would just also add a compile time flag that said I am static, and then we check it at runtime, which like, you know, it's just string parsing. It really doesn't mean that you're static. But it was coming back false, and we were actually like compiling it with like I am static, true. Um, and it was the weirdest thing, because we're like, but it is a static binary. Obviously, that meant nothing, because all we were doing was passing in true. Um, but the actual kind of flag in the binary was changing. And it actually would change on every single run with each commit change. So like some commits would work and some wouldn't. And when you're like working on an open source project with like a bunch of PRs per day, and so like some are failing or some aren't, like no one can get anything done because you're like, fuck, the CI is fucked. Um, so, and I was like kind of in charge of the CI, so I was like, oh shit, that's me. Um, so, <laughs> A little horrifying, um, and I'm pretty sure this happened on a Friday, like all good bugs, they happen on a Friday, like right before you're about to leave. Um, so we're all like kind of staring at each other and we're like, okay, well we gotta like reproduce this in a way so that Go, the Go team doesn't have to compile all of Docker because we don't want to be those assholes, right? Um, so we like keep trying to reproduce it in like just a main.go, a very like simple way, and we can't do it. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be the fucking asshole to be like, it only happens in this one weird way. Um, and so basically we had to do that. So I got the last straw. So like I had to open the issue and be like, eh, I'm so sorry. Um, and also you have to compile Docker, um, <laughs> which of course no one wants to do. Um, even though it compiles in Docker, but whatever, I digress. Um, so, finally, like, we go back and forth with, like, members of the Go team, including, like, Dave Cheney, who was like, did you LDD and check if it's static? And I'm like, dude, it's, like, just passing in fucking true. Like, it doesn't actually matter that it's static. Like, it's the fact that, like, the actual flag value is changing to false. Um, so, finally, like, one random person from the Go team, who, of course, now I forget his name, um, he came back and he was like, oh, you're passing in a Boolean. So like what was actually happening is for 
compile time variables, you have to pass in a string. And so it was just flipping the bit with every single different kind of commit. It was getting a different bit. So that was fucking crazy. And I was like, oh, if we had like a magnet, like maybe we could have also flipped the bit. Um, <laughs> the other horrifying thing about this is that like since we had compiled Docker like this for such a long time, and this was like a blocker before Docker starting, it was like it would check this variable before the binary even started. If we had like accidentally made a release and then it had been false, like that entire release would have been nuked and then I'm sure we would have hit it hacker news. So I think we were all just like, holy shit, that was close. Um, so super weird, but yeah, the way that the Go runtime had changed in this version actually made the bit flip like really very easy. Um, so that's a really weird bug. I kind of thought it was like super awesome though. Um, in terms of other chaos that I have caused, because I have this like, it's not like I do this on purpose, but whenever I'm bored, like chaos just happens. And maybe sometimes it's on purpose, I don't know, I can't tell. Um, like after I'm like, oh fuck, I did that. Um, so one time we were, um, before we were launching like the notary service for signing Docker image, uh, is like we were checking out that like, um, it would be, it would like hold up to kind of a lot of traffic. And I just like to obviously like inject traffic into things just to see if things topple over because I'm kind of an asshole. Um, so I was like, oh, like can I load balance your service? Um, and I probably annoyed them about it like 17 million times before they said yes. And then they were probably like, sure, we'll just let you do it so you shut up. Um, so. They said yes, which actually means that this was fine and everything I did was fine. Um, but the day that they said yes, I was obviously like busy for like eight hours. So by the time I remembered that they had said yes and I realized that I had time to do anything about it, it was like maybe 1 a.m. Um, so I was like, oh, I'm gonna load balance our service now. Like not even really thinking about any sort of bad things that could happen at 1 a.m. Super dumb. Like, I don't really think things through sometimes. So I was like, oh, I'll just do this, and then, like, tomorrow morning we'll handle it. Um, so I, like, took the URL that they had originally sent me. This is not my fault. And I put it into, obviously, like, this thing that I had made using containers. Of course, I didn't use, like, a normal tool. I wrote some bespoke fucking tool for testing this. Um, <laughs> actual insane person. Um, so. I just stuck the URL in and uh, I ended up like kind of testing their prod, I guess, which was already hooked up to paging people. And like, I'm pretty sure at that point, the whole like SRE team already hated me because there was a point before this where I had accidentally pulled so many Docker images that my IP got blocked, my like home IP. Um, <laughs> So I was not like really on their good side. So 1 a.m. when they get paged again, I'm like, oh God, I'm gonna have to make this up to them. So I uh, ended up like buying them tequila or whatever they wanted um, <laughs> to make it up to them. But to be fair, it was not my fault because that was the URL that I got. So yeah, I didn't have to do it at 1 a.m. though, but whatever. Also the tool that I built, which is archived, like do not use this. It's so bad, it uses open vSwitch, and like I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Um, it doesn't like just use open vSwitch, it like shells out to open vSwitch. Like there is a Go library for open vSwitch, but I was like, no, I'm gonna shell out. Um, so that's not great either. Um, but yeah, definitely don't use this, it's horrible, but it was cool that one day until I put it to rest. <laughs> Um, yeah, so another thing that um, I have bad habits with is, uh, so I, I, I had uh, kind of owned the whole like apt repository for Docker, which if you've ever experienced dealing with apt or like RPM, like never fucking do that. Um, there is like no good way to do it. Actually, there is. It is called package cloud. <laughs> and you just let them do it. Um, which is what I should have done, but I'm like, no, I'm gonna roll my own. Um, so, yeah, uh, we ended up like redoing the whole kind of 
Docker repository at some point so that you could actually allow pinning because I don't know if you all know this, but like there's this tool called Reaper Pro. It's horrible. But like you can't actually pin to a version on the package that you produce with it. So I'm like, why the fuck even make the tool? Because all people are gonna do is complain to you about the fact that they can't pin a version on your fucking repo. So yeah, you actually end up having to basically call all the dev file stuff yourself, which is fine. It's like Linux, it's all files. It's actually kind of cool once you know it, but like the whole getting there kind of sucks. Um, so yeah, I was kind of in charge of that, and I was the only one on PagerDuty, which I set up for it, but it was a static website, so I'm like, what the fuck can go wrong? Like, what the fuck can go wrong? Um, <laughs> Also, I should never be the only one on PagerDuty because what happened was whenever things would go down, which was like, it was a weird pattern when things would go down, but I'll also explain that. Um, so yeah, when things would go down, I was the only one that was paged and I tend to sleep through like literally anything. So when we would like hit the front page of Hacker News or something because we were down, um, that was not great. Um, but what actually was happening when we were down was um, it was cron jobs on DigitalOcean instances that all kind of triggered at the same time. And then it just like pwned it, um, which is crazy. And then also we had another time where it went down for like 10 hours, which like people get fucking angry when it's down for 10 hours. And that was because we forgot to pay our AWS bill. And when you forget to pay your AWS bill, you have to call them on the phone. But since we were like, we're gonna separate, um, you know, like the open source project from like Docker Inc. Um, we had our own AWS account. So like, we forgot to pay our bill, fucking idiots. We also didn't pay for support because we're like the open source team. We're like, we don't have money. Um, <laughs> so then we had to get the person who had the Docker Inc. account to call and be like, hey, we have this other account. Can you please like turn it back on? Because like we're even making your customers not be able to install Docker. Like this is like high priority here. <laughs> and it still took so long. Um, so absolutely horrifying. Never host an app repository. Just show that out to um, Package Cloud. They have like this really great service. And like Joe D'Amato, who works there, has this like great blog on like all sorts of kernel weird shit. Like they know what the fuck they're doing. Um, so do that. Sorry, this was not an ad and I did not mean to do that, but like I actually really love their thing. Um, <laughs> I have regrets. So the last one is just like kind of an instance where I was dumb. Um, so uh, everyone kind of complains about the behavior of like dev random versus dev you random. And it's just a lot of like uh, kind of people tend to hit this blocker and they're like, oh, I didn't realize that I should use dev random over dev random. So I was like, oh, you know what we could do in containers that's kind of cool for people so that they never hit this is we'll just like symlink dev random to dev random so that we always have dev random, right? And I'm like, look, I'm a genius. <laughs> I solved all the problems of the world for randomness. <laughs> um, but no, like right away, like after I sent this, of course on a Saturday, like what the fuck am I doing on a Saturday? Like you guys, I figured out a plan. Um, <laughs> and also on a Saturday, Greg KH is like, no, please don't. <laughs> and he's like, not really someone who responds on the containers mailing list. So I was like, oh shit. <laughs> yeah, and so I was like, oh, okay, let's definitely not do that. I don't know what I was thinking, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and then like a few other people responded and I was like, no, no, I think by summoning Greg KH, like we, we should stop. So yeah, um, good times. Uh, like never be afraid to be wrong because like, hey, maybe if that wasn't a bad idea, we could have solved randomness for everyone. Although still a problem if anyone wants to solve that, like I have no fucking clue what to do. I guess some people rely on the behavior of dev random. Who fucking knew? <laughs> so yeah, um, just thought I'd cover all those uh, before I go into my usual spiel. Um, so 
I kind of wanted to go over what a container is, and then I have this like really cool demo after that's like a little bit crazy, so don't do it in production, okay? It was like a hack. Um, but yeah, so I kind of like to make it clear that containers are not real things. Uh, they're made up of Linux primitives. Well, now like Windows has containers and all that, so just like forget that for now. Um, but yeah, so before containers, you know, there were zones, jails, and VMs, and all of those are kind of like this first class concept. Like if you're on Solaris, you just create a zone. If you're on uh, FreeBSD or OpenBSD, whatever your type is, um, you can actually, you know what, jails is only on one of them, sorry. So you can create jails, and then VMs, first class concept as well. Uh, but containers, like, they're made up of C groups, which are control groups, namespaces, and LSMs, which are Linux security modules, um, and then blah, 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 which is like all this other shit and duct tape. Um, so yeah, um, all of this kind of together forms containers. So real things and not a real thing. Um, so this is a feature and not a bug, in my opinion, but people will tell you otherwise. Um, so I kind of really love this because I'm like a huge weirdo um, and I like to combine shit in weird ways. So like namespaces control what a process can see. So if you use a pin namespace, like you can only see things within that pin namespace and not all the host processes. And then same goes for all those listed there. But one of the cool things with Docker is like, and you all, might have played with this already. Uh, but you can do like net host and run in the host network, or you can you know, run in the network of a different container and kind of combine things. So if you want to run like Wireshark um, next to a container with like an actual service that you wanted to like trace or something, you can do that by sharing the namespace. And you can't do that with jails or zones or a VM. You can't just be like, I want to run this thing in the same network. It just wouldn't work. Um, so that's kind of cool. And then control processes control what a process can use. So this is all like controlling how much memory you can use, how much CPU. You also get like all sorts of really cool statistics from this for like how much memory you are using um, and stuff like that. So that's really cool, especially when it comes to like network statistics on like what containers are using what type of bandwidth. So yeah, this is kind of how I visualize it. Um, and then on top you have like all the kind of uh, security modules. So AppArmor is one of these. And uh, we have like all these defaults in Docker that you can look up if you want, so it's like super boring. Um, there's SE Linux, which is another Linux security module. And we have defaults for those as well that really just prevent like doing dumb things. Um, and then we have SecComp as well, which prevents um, running certain sys calls. Um, and we prevent dumb things there as well. Um, so that's kind of like the basics of what a container is. Um, but I kind of wanted to explain that before I show my really weird demo. So, yeah. Oh, just kidding, hang on. I'm SSHing into my apartment. Oops, I just typed my password. Okay, I can't do talk and do this at the same time. Okay, so let me make this bigger. This is one of my Intel NICs in my apartment. Not that that matters, but it's kind of cool. Um, so um, I don't know if you all noticed, but on Docker registry now, you can uh, have multi-architecture images, which like was largely pushed by IBM and all those that kind of have those architectures. So like there's PowerPC, um, System Z. Uh, whatever you want. Um, so, yeah, I, I got this box, a server, um, not this, sorry, um, but it was ARM64, and I'm like lazy as fuck. And I was like, I wanna run shit on here, but I don't wanna have to recompile it, and I don't wanna use a VM. So I had been talking to, um, James Bottomley, who works at IBM Research. He's really cool, he's like a kernel dev. Um, and he was showing me like what he does to kind of debug and play around with PowerPC stuff because he uses like an Intel computer, right? So um, QEMU, 
or however you say that, oh my god, sorry, uh, <laughs> has uh, emulation for devices, um, and they, they, it comes with like binaries for doing that. So um, actually, I can just show whatever those are. I like forget what they're named for what it's worth. That's why I'm doing this. It's like something dash something or whatever. Yeah, so they have like a bunch of these binaries that like allow you to run. If you combine this binary name and then like you're executable after it, um, you can run it in just the emulation without like a VM. And it's like super fast. So another cool thing about Linux other than this um, is bin fumped misc, uh, which is so dope. So that allows you to kind of define binary formats. Um, so what I had done before is I copied the blog flare, uh, the Cloudflare blog post where they did like scripting in Go. And that's kind of where I realized bin bump is, is like the fucking coolest. Um, and then I realized that you could like put containers in there, which is really cool if you like compiled it as a static binary, which like absurd, but I put containers in weird places. Um, and then I was thinking about this, like obviously you could probably use bin font misc to um, control, you know, running binaries of different architectures, but like that's a lot of work and it's like, well, it's not a lot of work, you just have to put some files places because it's Linux, um, but nobody really wants to do that. But what they look like is, uh, Here's an example, if I can spell, which I can. So um, kind of define the binary, and then the magic file number is what we're doing for the binary itself. And then the really like key here, this was the name, this is the binary. Um, the key here is these flags. Um, so this makes sure, which, this is gonna sound wildly insecure, which is why I said don't try this at home. Um, and make sure that like the usual behavior of bin fun bisque is that you need like the absolute path to like whatever it's coming after the binary and the binary itself. So when you're in a container, which was obviously my goal here, I'm like, I wanna do this, but in a container, um, you're in a different mount path, like you're in varlib docker, whatever the fuck. Um, so it's not like you're in the place with the binary like user bin where you are. So these actually make sure that the shell is just like, you just take what the shell interprets, which yeah, it sounds horrifying, but like, let's just trust the shell, whatever. Um, so <laughs> it's totally fine. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna try this um, because this is like totally how he does it. Um, and it's like super dope, but I was like, I'm gonna do it using run C because that's also really cool. So if we just go into like one of my dumb projects here, um, I have this binary that looks up shipping track mids for things that I buy on Amazon. Um, so not that I have a problem. <laughs> I don't know why I do this in the command line. Um, so yeah, it's a Go binary, it's pretty cool. Um, it's really not that cool, please don't use it. Um, <laughs> so if I compile this as like PPC64, right? Uh, I'll just build it. And then I can even read elf to prove to you that I'm not like fucking with you. Yeah, power PC 64, swear to God, okay. So, um, and also like this will obviously work on my host, like sans those flags, like you don't need those to actually do it on your host, but um, like it worked, I got the help. I'm not gonna show you all my shipping track minutes, that would be horrifying. Um, <laughs> so, like, let's pop that into a container. Um, so if I just make, I had an old demo dir, so I'm gonna just remove it. I'll like just make a new one. Um, I don't know if you all have used run C, but it's like actually pretty dope. So like, we'll create a spec. And so this goes into a config.json right here. Um, I'm gonna turn off the terminal because we don't need it. Um, I'm also gonna change the argument to that binary that we just made. And 
in the rootfs that I set up is just going to be like the root. So that's cool. All the rest is just like defaults. It's like super dumb. So don't worry. The defaults are nice. Okay. So I'm going to make the rootfs. This directory has to be named rootfs for what it's worth. Um, then I'm going to copy in my binary from before. Oops. Uh, my go path. Don't judge my typing skills. Okay. <laughs> oh. oh, I like cursed myself when I said that. Okay. There we go. Um, also, I'm just gonna like prove to you that that's the same binary, just in case you don't trust me. Like, I don't know if I trust myself to be honest. Cool, okay, still power PC, phew, okay. So if I just like pop out of that dirt, then I'll uh, create the container. By the way, this is like what Docker does on the inside, same as container D. Um, actually, so Docker calls container D, which calls run C, because you've got to have like a bajillion layers of software, um, or else people on the internet yell at you. So um, <laughs> it's literally why it's like that. Uh, we're gonna create it. Um, so B is like my bundle directory, which is now named demo2, and then the container ID, you can pass in like any arbitrary string, and that's also, I'm just gonna call it demo2. Um, I think I have to sudo this, like an adult. Cool, so that created, I got no errors, dope. Uh, so now I'm gonna start it. <laughs> and it's just gonna like return the help like before. Cool, so like, what you can do with that, if you imagine that you like entirely built it out, which I did not take the time to do because I'm not actually that insane, um, is you could pull these multi-architecture images in Docker down and then just execute them like normal executables and like look how fast that was. Um, so all it's doing using is the emulation. Um, and that's kind of really cool in terms of like testing and stuff like that. Also in terms of my laziness and not wanting to recompile things. So yeah, that was kind of the demo I was going for. Um, sweet, okay, I'll move back over to what else I was doing, but I wanna just pop down because some of the stuff is dumb and now I don't wanna do it. Okay, cool. So um, I also thought it would be cool to give like a history of Linux containers because Docker was not the first and we are not like the worst. Like maybe they're all bad, I don't know. Um, like blame the others for sending us down this path. I'm just kidding. Um, I actually really like containers. Okay, so they've been around for a long time. Um, OpenBZ like was one of the first. Um, obviously before this like C groups were contributed to the kernel by uh, Google which are now maintained by Facebook. Um, so that's kind of cool. And they're still like building features into C groups. So that's like super, super cool. Um, then there was like Linux v server, then LXC. And actually Docker for a long time used LXC as the back end for doing things. And it's like actually ironic that like now Docker calls container D then run C when like the whole point of us getting rid of LXC was to like have it be one fucking thing. So it went from being multiple fucking things to one to multiple because everyone complained. So yeah, um, thank the internet. Um, so then Docker was released in uh, like March of 2013. And yeah, like I said, we used LXC as the back end. We actually like supported LXC for a long time. Like I wrote a lot of unit tests for LXC. It's like not fun. Um, but then we finally got rid of it, which was great. Um, because I didn't have to do that anymore. There was all this weird stuff. Not LXC's fault, it was just like not something we wanted to maintain. Um, so then shortly after that, there was Let Me Contain That For You, which I still think is the coolest name. Um, and this came out of Google, and uh, it was like a C++ library and binary. Um, and then they ended up contributing to libcontainer. And actually on my first day at Docker, like they were there at the office and it was really cool. And then on my first day at Google, like I saw them again and I was like, you guys, that's weird. Um, <laughs> I am insanely awkward. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> and 
And then after that, it was Rocket, which kind of started the container wars, but like nobody contributes to Rocket anymore. So like, this is like a lot of wasted engineering effort over drama. Um, but that's cool. Like actually like the kind of consultancy that made this, it's called Kinfolk, it's in Berlin. They're like super dope. Um, you should look them up. They have this conference called like All Systems Go. It's really cool. I think that's what it's called. Um, but yeah, they're, they're like super dope people, so yeah. Uh, and then after that, like Docker released Run C, which was literally just container D with a binary, but, uh, or uh, lib container with a binary, sorry. Um, and lib container actually always had this binary that was called uh, NS init. Oh my God, my brain is failing me, I'm getting old. Uh, and NS init, I think was a cooler name too, but whatever. Um, branding. So, uh, yeah, this was supposed to be like a reaction, I guess, to Rocket or whatever, um, but it's honestly what everyone uses today, so whatever. Um, so yeah, there's a bajillion more now, like I literally lost track. Um, like my time frame for container runtimes, to be honest, like ended that day. I was like, I can't do anymore, that was a lot. Um, so I don't even know what the new ones are, they're probably fine too, who knows. Um, also, people define runtime in a different way now, too, because there's so many layers of software. Like, I've got lost in the layers of software. Um, so, I'll stop with that. Um, and then another thing that I wanted to cover that kind of relates to chaos is, like, if you like uh, finding chaos, you can try to uh, use something that I made. Um, so, personally, I like to think about containers as Legos. Um, and like I said before, like VMs, zones, and jails, uh, they're all kind of like, you got the Lego set put together, which like is no fun. Um, I don't know why you'd ever do that. Um, but they're the Death Star, so you don't have to do any work, you just get it, and I guess you'd put it on display or something. Um, they come pre-assembled, and like containers are just the pieces, so it says to build the Death Star, but you don't have to build the Death Star, you can build whatever you want. You could build this. But you can turn on and off certain namespaces, like I said, and then also like um, one of the examples is like a Kubernetes pod, if you're familiar, like they share a PID in that namespace. One so that PID is so that it can send signals to the various processes, and then net so that kind of out of convenience for the whole network. Um, and that layer of software that's container network. <laughs> um, so everything's kind of like a tunable knob, which is really cool. Um, Docker has like sane defaults so people don't shoot themselves in the foot. Um, and I kind of described those earlier. Uh, but a lot of the feedback that we got were like containers are not secure from people who like literally didn't know what containers were. Um, so to prove or at least give them an incentive to prove themselves, um, I made this site called contain.ai. And like honestly, it first started out as like this kind of cool game where you're given this terminal that I like severely locked down um, and you know, you're asked like a series of questions like do you have access to capnet admin? Um, and then you'd like try to do something um, that you would need that for, like maybe change IP tables, I don't know. Um, and then you'd say no. So like there's kind of these, this cool like learning aspect of it, but the like hidden aspect is that behind like every single instance, which honestly is just one, um, <laughs> is a flag. So uh, if you were to pop this container, um, you would then have to actually pop another container because it's double nested. Um, and depending on the bug you had, you would only have to pop one or two. Um, but then you could get the flag and then you can send it to me and then I will give you like eternal fame and like maybe a few thousand dollars. Like, whatever you honestly want. If there's like a real kernel bug, I will like find fucking money for you. Um, that's fine. <laughs> I work at a big company, like I think we can find some money. Um, so yeah, no one's popped this though, but it's like really nice because whenever people do come to me like containers are not secure, I'm like, yo, fucking do it then. Um, <laughs> so. No one's done it. Um, I kind of like would actually love to see a bug though because I'm sure there are some, but you would have to like uh, transverse multiple file paths in the kernel almost or find bugs in multiple kind of subsystems to get 
out of it based on the layers of software there. Um, so it, it's kind of like a nice thing. Also, like in terms of threat modeling um, these systems, uh, usually like uh, popping a container or VM is not your highest risk. Because if you think about it from the point of like you're deploying an application, like that's the whole point of containers other than my weird desktop use case. Um, like you're deploying an application to the cloud, right? And your application is like on the internet, just like my fucking application here. Um, so someone would have to find a vulnerability in your application, right? And then get remote code execution in that container or something of that sort. Um, and then they'd also have to pop the container. Or they'd have to, you know, like pop your, uh, first your orchestrator where you left your dashboard open on the internet like so many people do. So like there's a lot of easier ways to um, kind of hack people than the whole getting to your container because also like the second you're inside the container, my first move would be like what volumes are mounted um, because there's probably really good data in there. Or um, what network do I have access to? Um, because any sort of network endpoints, if you're not firewalling them, like you'd have access to those. So like at that point, I don't have to pop a container. Like I just have to use what you put in there. Um, so I would be like very adamant about what you're putting into containers, um, which is kind of the point. Um, and then also like don't worry that much. Um, I mean, the world is obviously on fire like at all times, but I don't think this is like the biggest concern. <laughs> Um, so it'd be great if we could just like end that. Um, so yeah, that was like kind of all I had. It was a little bit random, sorry. Um, but yeah, <laughs> thanks.